It's unsparing, it's poetic, it's cautionary, it is um, a record of brutality, uh, and it is a record of policy carried to this extreme end, which as the Pentagon Papers showed us, and as these leaders said, they didn't really know what they were doing. Or they did, or it was an extension of, of I mean, it, it, its roots go back to the late 40s. The idea of John Foster Dulles proposing that nuclear weapons be used in Vietnam in 1954, that the sabotage of the, the 54 of the Geneva Agreements, that the subsequent administrations that continued to follow, um, where was the disconnect? I just, you know, it, I mean, it, was it Cold War policy, which was just blind? Um, what was the importance of Vietnam? How did Vietnam threat? I mean, there's so many questions that are raised by all of this. I mean, how much of it is grew out of a sort of cultural self-image that continued to justify it? Uh, how could there be so much cruelty, really, to me? It's just, it stands as this watershed that would hopefully lead towards revelation, but um, I don't know, just some thoughts I have, just generally speaking, I mean, uh, um, of course we know recently, it was, it was it, it, in, the, in 1968, Lyndon Johnson, after he decided not to run for re-election, uh, did commit himself to trying to move the Paris Peace Agreements forward to a resolution, and there was hope in the fall of 1968 for a peace agreement, and that Nixon, it's now been pretty much confirmed, including tape recordings, sabotaged the Paris Peace Agreement that was sort of emerging by convincing Chu not to come to an agreement. And that Johnson confirmed that information in late October leading into the election and was advised by Clark Clifford, among others, not to go public with it because there was an assumption that Nixon was going to win the election and they didn't want to hobble him in his efforts. But it's also true then that Chu, by having uh, collaborated with Nixon in this sabotage of a peace initiative, held cards over Nixon that made it harder, in fact, for Nixon <coughs> even to extricate himself as things continued. But um, a new twist on the history of that period, which caused the war to continue then into 1969, 1970, 1971, 1972, peace agreements in 73, and sort of a petering out of the war in 74 and 75. A lot of additional war resulted from that. And I'm just, I'm sort of free associating here, Peter, but why don't you, uh, and we should hear from the audience, but. Uh... Well, I think everything you just said is uh, not only true, but uh, it's worse than true. It's um, disgraceful. And, you know, <clears throat> when, when people start to think, and governments kind of don't want us to think, then we're going to want freedom. And governments also, when they make a policy, a war policy, you're not free anymore. And uh, it becomes very dangerous. And of course, <clears throat> when you're in combat, of course you're not free. You've got to follow. Um, what the officer tells you to do. Um, but this is the thing that discourages me the most about right now, is that we have a government that does not encourage us to think. And part of the attack on the press is, you know, don't think uh, as bad, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but as bad as uh, the president's acting towards uh, the press during that time, and can't even like the president. Johnson did, Nixon hated the press. They never called it fake news. So what we're getting now, I, mean, I, I don't mean to get away from the film, talk about the film, I'm happy to talk about the film, 
and, uh, and all that has followed from that. But right now, we're in a worse fix than we've been in in 50 years. Right, and it's, um, it's different, it's, more, it's modern, it's, I mean, um, the, the areas of sort of disintegration of democratic practice are in, in of new areas, different areas. Um, decades of policy towards the environment is being unraveled, decades of policy for social service, you know, likewise, uh, foreign policy just seems sort of by the seat of the pants and to a certain extent, but... Uh, well, except that, except that we have a president who likes dictators. Right. I, I just uh, have to right. pay a little tribute to Jay, uh, because he was working, and I, I started to talk about this in my introduction, but I mean, he worked for the Ellsberg Russo defense during the trial that I was not able to make the film about, so I made the film you just saw instead. But I think that was well, a great thing for you to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. yeah, I mean, I got very caught up in the war. I mean, I had just a full-time uh, occupation of mine for like three or four years to, to oppose the war. And uh, I actually testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when uh, Wolf Fulbright was the chairman, and we saw Fulbright in the film talking about Vietnam. And uh, it was, you know, we were there to commit civil disobedience. I mean, I was one of the leaders of the May Day demonstration, uh, 12,800 people arrested, the biggest mass arrest in American history, blah, blah, blah. Nobody thinks about it much. But I testified before that, and, and uh, we were given a hard time by the senators. You know, why are you here, and what's this all about? And, I think we gave DC testimony, but it, there was a real edge to the in, encounter. It was, you know, um, George Aiken was one of the senators, it was Hugh Scott, it was Chuck Percy, it was uh, Jacob Javits, it was Fulbright, it was, you know, uh, and also a different sort of breed of senators from that period. After the hearing, when we'd been given a hard time, Fulbright came up to me and he asked me to stay for a moment. He came up to me and he said, I only, he said, what you're doing is so important. He said, I only wish that the students under Hitler had responded with the same spirit of resistance, because what you're doing is equivalent to that. To which I said, well, why did you beat us up so badly when the cameras were running? We were giving the testimony. And he just said, uh, he said, just take that with you, you know. And, and I, I was surprised, because publicly he made no, no expression of support for what we were doing, which was committing civil disobedience. Not, unfortunately, nobody got hurt. It was, it was an effective action, I think. But privately, he had a different point of view. And similarly, and this is the last thing I'll say that I want to, you know, we open I asked Patrick Leahy, our United States Senator from Vermont, during the Obama years, where I really felt, especially after Mitch McConnell took away the Supreme Court nominee, I said, how can, how, why is this happening, and why is it standing, why is it being allowed to happen? He said it was happening because of the racism of members of Congress and, and an environment against Obama. But again, it's not something that was ever brought publicly into the discourse. Uh, anyway, I don't know. So there's that whole aspect. Yeah. Uh, in the back row, yes. Yes, you. I'm sorry, is it Anne? Yes, that is Anne. That's Anne Freund, who was very much involved with this period of time. Yeah, Anne. I saw this film when it first came out, and was you know, tremendously moved by it and especially relieved that finally there was a whole sort of visual story about this, the nature of the war, the, the origins of the war, the impact of the war on Americans and Vietnamese that we've been talking about in the anti-war movement. Looking at it now, almost 50 years later, I notice how little there is in the film about the anti-war I didn't notice that before, in the sense that it, uh, it doesn't really cover some of the big events, a little bit, the vets throwing their medals over the uh, wall at the Congress, uh, something about you know, 
Democratic Convention. But the division in the country about the war is, is more muted than I remembered. And I wonder if that was sort of a decision on your part to not focus on, since the war was still going on, not focus on the anti-war movement. Yes, it was a very conscious, deliberate decision. I really wanted to focus on the war. Um, if I could make a film about Trump, it wouldn't have anybody in this room in it. It would only be about the Trump people. I want to get in, you know, to, to Scott Pruitt, thank goodness he's gone, uh, Carson, Betsy DeVos. That's who I would want to have in my film. So, no, I didn't want the anti-war movement in the film. I didn't want to be <clears throat> preaching to the converted, um, by, uh, to the choir. I, I really wanted to show the people who, everyone in the film um, that I interview was pro-war at one time or another. Now, Ellsberg, who had been a Marine in Vietnam, turned against the war. Clark Clifford finally turned against the war. But everyone had been for the war or fought the war at some time uh, in their lives. That's what I wanted. Um, I, I understand that the anti-war movement deserves its own film, deserves a great deal of credit, but that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted the pro-war movement and to show what that led to, to, to convey the experience convey the experience, if I could, of what it's like to be at war, to be, to want the war, and then to see what happens to the country as a result of waging the war. I couldn't help um, but think about the Nuremberg trials and the principles that came out from that uh, era. And the fact that there was never, in my memory, there was never any serious discussion about what you so clearly point out as criminality and attack on civilians that would seem to violate the Geneva Conventions and the Nuremberg Principles. But I don't remember anyone ever talking about that. And um, I just wondered if you have some thoughts about it. Well, Telford Taylor, who was uh, one of the um, Nuremberg, <coughs> as a young lawyer, one of the people at Nuremberg, he prosecutor, was, U.S. prosecutor, a prosecutor, yeah, he he was uh, very much against the war in Vietnam, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there could have been trials. We could have had all kinds of recriminations against the people who led us to war, who lied, I mean, people like Rostow. I don't know that that would have done the country a whole lot of good. Um, but um, I'm although the happy to hear that point. And I, I'm happy to hear the point about my not uh, getting any real screen time to the uh, anti-war movement. And if that's a criticism, I accept it's it. That just a, wasn't a film that I wanted. It's definitely not a criticism. I just didn't notice it yeah. before, and now I'm noticing it. And now I, I understand. I suspected that was a rational um, I think I was thinking hearts and minds. We were trying to win over the hearts and minds of Americans and in various ways, or Congress people to cut ABQ and stuff like that. But I realized that that's not what we were trying. That phrase, by the way, is being used again in Afghanistan. I didn't know that until I read the New York Times magazine a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is uh, a whole story about uh, the army. Telford Taylor, who was, who was a chief prosecutor of Nuremberg, actually went to Hanoi, went to North Vietnam, right during that 1972 Christmas bombing on a delegation with Joan Baez. He was teaching at Columbia at the time. I actually interviewed him when he came back. And he was very clear that the war crimes that had been committed in Vietnam should be prosecuted. But that there was no ability to make it happen uh, because I mean, in, in World War II, the Germans were defeated. And therefore, there was the ability 
to uh, exert some accountability in that situation. He said that, if, that he said there was no way, there was no mechanism to bring accountability to it. Now, more recently, we were dealing with the issue of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, for example. Uh, which, is a, which is an arm of the UN, a justice division. Slobodan Milosevic was prosecuted there for crimes during the Serbia-Bosnia uh, debacle um, in the, in the uh, 90s. And, um, but the United States does not subscribe to the International uh, Criminal Court either. I mean, there, because that raises questions about if Saddam Hussein, for example, was a criminal, and guilty of war crimes or crimes against his people or whatever, why was he not brought to The Hague to be placed uh, under trial there as an alternative to 12 years of war? You know, um, Assad has been named by the International Criminal Court, for example, in Syria. Why has there not been an effort to apprehend him and take him to uh, The Hague? You know, would this, could this, serve as a deterrent to criminal behavior in dictatorships around the world, A, and B, uh, prevent instead this massive suffering and massive war that takes place. Um, can, why can't the world unite, world leaders unite, in demanding, you know, an alternative to this mobilization of combat? And those are just two examples. Assad out now, Gaddafi was also under indictment by the World Criminal Court. And again, and that was not a pro protracted uh, battle, but nonetheless, he could have also been taken. He was under indictment by the World Criminal Court. The fact that the United States does not participate, to me, is there are 132 nations that are signatories to this. Obama secretly worked with to, to support the World Criminal Court, but he did not feel that he had any mandate or any ability to try to bring Congress to a point of authorization and participation. So these are political issues, because there was fear that you know, Dick Cheney or these other people could have been brought to the Criminal Court for the way that the Iraq War was conducted, for example. But, but on the other hand, if, if leaders are able to get away with this, there needs to be, the world needs to assert some accountability on these, at the least the behaviors of war. So striking at civilian populations is a war crime. So anyway, I don't know. I mean, I think it's worth, I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah, in the back, the right. Yes, young woman there. Yes. Um, yes, um, I found the film to be just brilliantly edited. Um, and some much of the meeting and experience um, I had was built through the edit not follow a, a conventional structure um, in any way. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you uh, form the structure of a film in the edit and how you um, worked um, with the editors. What was your process like? That's a wonderful, not just question, but challenge. I have to go back. Okay. Go ahead, right. It took about three months just to screen our dailies, okay? And I'm taking notes on I filled 12 um, legal-sized yellow pad notebooks with notes, even though we were having transcripts made, but I was taking notes on this seems to be where a person is being emotional, which is not going to show up in a transcript, where uh, a, another person is interrupting if it's not, a, uh, uh, you know, it's not an interview, but some kind of conversation. And uh, well, it just took forever and ever. It took a whole year to edit. It took a year to do the shooting, another year to edit. And the editing began with um, an assembly that lasted maybe eight or nine hours, an assembly of footage that I really liked, that we liked. I mean, the two editors, uh, Lindsay Clayman and Susan Martin, um, and I, you know, we just had our heads together all the time. And, uh, by the way, um, uh, we didn't have disagreements either. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, one of them would take a certain sequence. Oh, well, I'll tell you. Um, the um, uh, brothel 
sequence of the two gods and the two um, prostitutes. That was a sequence that when they first looked at it, um, they hated it so much and they felt it was so anti-woman, so terrible. Uh, they said, this should not really be in the film. So I said, okay, let's look at it again, just isolated, not in, in the context of all the other footage, just isolated, let's look at it again. Well, by the end of our looking at it again, which is about 40 minutes of film, you know, about four magazines of 16 millimeter film, uh, they had an argument about which one of them was going to get to cut it, because each of them wanted to be the editor of that particular sequence. In other words, they then felt, no, this is not anti-woman. What it is is it shows what horrible people men can be. And uh, so uh, that's just one example. Um, at one point, then we got it down to a five and a half hour version, not a rough cut, an assembly. And on Christmas Eve of 1973, my wonderful executive producer, he doesn't take executive producer credit for complicated reasons, but anyway, Bert Schneider said, you know, we, we really have to have a, a screening. I, I need to see something. So, I, you know, I've been working on the film for a year and a half, and he made Hollywood films. After two months, three months, he gets to see uh, what one of his films uh, looks like. Um, they made Last Picture Show, um, Five, Easy Five Easy Pieces, which is a fantastic film. Anyway, he would get to see it pretty quickly. In a year and a half, he hadn't seen anything. And uh, so I said, okay, well, it turned out the screening was on Christmas Eve. And he invited 50 of his Hollywood friends. It was practically the worst experience I've ever had up to that time. Five and a half hours. I, I don't make the kind of film that uh, Fred Wiseman makes, and I admire him unreservedly, but that's a different kind of film. And uh, we had two funerals in it. There was combat all over the place. It was displayed. And, um, and at the end, you know, people just walked out. And I heard one guy um, who was married to a woman that owned a great deal of Warner Brothers, and he was going down in the elevator and he said, Ugh, that was forever. I couldn't have agreed more. It was worse for me than it was for him. I hated it. Well, that was the most difficult Christmas Eve I ever had up to that point. But uh, in a way, what Bert did was sharpen our focus. Because one thing you can do when you show a film to people when it's not ready to be shown, you see where energy drops. And my father um, said to me, um, you know, when a movie, because he used to be an editor um, before he became a screenwriter, he, he, he said when energy drops and you lose the audience, you have to work all the more hard to get it back again. So you really try not to lose that. Well, okay, that was a wonderful lesson that he gave me, but I had to, you have to learn these things for yourself. And uh, so after Christmas Eve, things happened more quickly. We got down to three hours within, I don't know, two or three weeks after that. And then we got down finally to below two hours. Now, that's as much time as anybody else besides you wants to hear of that answer. But that's kind of a short form answer about the film editing of Hearts and Minds. Yes? This may have to be our last question. Oh, uh, I think this will be our last question. Some questions? Okay, Peter, I, I have to go, but yeah, go ahead. I'm just really curious because I've editing the manuscripts. Could you speak up? Okay, I'm curious because I've edited the manuscripts. I don't want to hear about the like that you felt you had to take out because of interest of time or things that you didn't like that you had to take out. Like, that you thought this is wonderful but maybe it doesn't fit or yeah uh, there was an interview with Tony Russo um, 
who was, was part of the Ellsbury thing. Yeah, uh, to somebody not to use Tony Russo's interview was uh, tough. And so that was an example of something that I took out. Okay, just the last question. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was raised with this story of the counterculture, right? I, I was raised by parents who were part of the anti-war movement. All of the media that we consumed for my entire life was, was that side of the story. So seeing the other side, uh, sort of the straight man line of, of the very pro-war uh, experience was uh, frankly shocking to me. Um, and I wonder, um, with this perspective from someone who, who didn't live through the war, do you worry uh, that we were all raised sort of without that context? Does that worry you? Do you think that that has led to something like Trump being in power? Thanks for that question. Not exactly. Um, I think that what led to Trump's being in power is uh, the disillusionment with the policies of a lot of presidents, and very much including the Republican presidents, that spread through the country. Um, we're, in the, we're in these two wars now that have no resolution, that we're not even trying to win either of them, whatever victory might mean. Um, we're, uh, we had a kind of static uh, uh, wage uh, earning. You know, people were disillusioned with government in general. And so I think enough people said, well, let's try this guy. He, he, uh, he you know, he talks big. Um, maybe he can do something. Uh, look, um, we should never forget that uh, Trump uh, did not win the popular vote. But he won enough states to become our president. And uh, so I tried to, uh, tried to tell you that. But uh, to finish on, a, on an up note, I'd like to say, let's nobody give up. Uh, as Churchill put it, never, 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 never surrender. So let's keep going with what we believe.